Good morning. And how are you today? Good. And good morning to everybody on Zoom. Hope you are well. Hope your coffee cups are full and your water is fresh and cool. And it's great to have everybody here today gathered virtually or in real life. Um, welcome to old friends and new friends. My name is Bryony Wood and um, I'm grateful to Ben for letting me lead and preach to you today. So um, let's just pray for a moment as we prepare our hearts and minds. Let us worship God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. And as we begin our worship this morning, there's a very important thing that we need to do. And that is to read the bands of marriage for those couples who are getting married in the next few weeks. Um, no doubt they've been struggling with all the COVID restrictions. So it's really good that we've got this opportunity to pray for them. There are quite a few, so bear with me. So I publish the bands of marriage for the first time between Nathan James Bridgman and Fiona Eleanor Campbell, both of the Parish of St. Saviours, and James Vernon Sims and Natalie Jane Jennings, also of the Parish of St. Saviours. And those two couples are having their bands published for the first time. For the second time, I publish the bands of marriage between Christopher James Kirk and Leah Amelia Thiedman, and of Christopher Aaron Rose and Donna Marie Alsop, and of Samuel John Fallowell and Nikita Jane Reed. And those three couples are having their bands read for the second time. And then for the third time of asking, Matthew Thomas Saxby and Amy Jade Whelan. All these couples are resident of St. Saviour's Parish Church in Retford. So if you know any cause or impediment why these two persons should not be joined together in holy matrimony, you are to declare it now. Father God, we bring all these couples before you. We pray that your blessing, your joy and your love will surround and uphold them as they plan their wedding day. And may these marriages be lifelong and life-giving in your name. Amen. And just another notice, if you don't receive the newsletter online or if you don't get one posted through your letterbox, they are here to pick up in church or take one home from today. So shall we pray? as a prayer to say together on the screen. God of our days and years, we set this time apart for you. Form us in the likeness of Christ so that our lives may glorify you. Amen. And we are going to sing now, I believe, and it is, I believe, which is a creedal song that we're going to say as we affirm what we believe in our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you're in church, then I suggest that you perhaps mouth or sing in your hearts rather than out loud. If you want to stand, you're very welcome to do so but obviously stay where you are in your social distancing places. And at home, let's hope that we can hear you from St. Saviour's singing from wherever you are. Thank you.
For I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. And we do, we come to him as his precious, beloved, forgiven people. But we know we are not yet completely of the character of Christ. And so we sometimes let him down. We sometimes mar the image of God in us. So let's pause for a moment now and allow the Holy Spirit perhaps to speak into our hearts and our minds and our lives and just see where we might need to get back on course with God. Let's pause for a moment. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Let us therefore rejoice by putting away all malice and evil and confess our sins with a sincere and true heart. We have not always worshipped God, our creator. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We have not always followed, followed Christ, our saviour. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. We have not always trusted in the Holy Spirit, our counsellor and guide. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. So may the Father of all mercies cleanse you from our sins and restore you in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so... Rejoicing once again in that acceptance of the forgiveness already given. Let us pray together the church's prayer for today. God of truth, help us to keep your law of love and to walk in the ways of wisdom that we may find true life in Jesus Christ your son. Amen. Amen. I think that the children are doing, not necessarily going out in a big group today, are they? I think they're staying with us today, so um, we don't need to do them out, but should we just pray for them anyway? Lord God, thank you that you give us a family of all ages to worship together. Lord, remind us that you said that we need to come to you as little children, open and innocent and eagerly seeking you. So we pray for all our children in this extended church family that may, they may know your truth and love. Amen. And on that note, I'm going to ask Rosie to come up and give us the Bible reading. Good morning, everyone. Right, today's reading is from Exodus chapter 12. And it's to be found on page 67. And it's when the firstborn of Egypt are threatened. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in Egypt. This month is to be the first month of the year for you. Give these instructions to the whole community of Israel. On the 10th day of this month, each man must choose either a lamb or a young goat for his household. If his family is too small to eat a whole animal, he and his next door neighbor may share an animal in proportion to the number of people and the amount that each person can eat. You may choose either a sheep or a goat but it must be a one-year-old male without any defects. Then, on the evening of the 14th day of the month, the whole community of Israel will kill the animals. 
the people are to take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts and above the doors of the houses in which the animals are to be eaten. That night, the meat is to be roasted and eaten with bitter herbs and with bread made without yeast. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled, but eat it roasted whole, including the head, the legs and the internal organs. You must not leave any of it until morning. If any is left over, it must be burnt. You are to eat it quickly, for you are to be dressed for travel with your sandals on your feet and your stick in your hand. It is the Passover festival to honour me, the Lord. On that night, I will go through the land of Egypt, killing every firstborn male, both human and animal, and punishing all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood on the doorposts will be a sign to mark the houses in which you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you and will not harm you when I punish the Egyptians. You must celebrate this day as a religious festival to remind you of what I, the Lord, have done. Celebrate it for all time to come. This is the word of the Lord. Shall we pray? Merciful God, as we turn together to the written word and listen to the spoken word, may we meet with the living word even Jesus Christ himself. Amen. Well, um, when Ben asked me to preach on this passage, I didn't realise quite what a struggle it was going to be. And I've been preaching since 2006, and I have to say I don't remember spending as much time grappling over a passage as I did with this one. So bear with me. There's not a lot of laughs in this. You need to know that but hopefully there's a lot that can inspire us and teach us and um, remind us of who God is. There's a program on Radio 4 that I like. You may have heard it. It's called The Long View. It looks at familiar events from a historical perspective and gives the long view of how they are connected. By looking at today at the account of the Passover, we are going to take that long view and we're going to see how those historical events bring them up to a bit later in history and then to today. Last week, Ben spoke about the power struggles between Moses and Pharaoh through the devastating plagues, showing that God's power was supreme. And all of this was to fulfill God's promise in Exodus chapter six, when God said, I will free you from the burdens of the Egyptians, deliver you from slavery and redeem you with an outstretched arm and mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. And now after nine plagues, nine warnings, it was the day of reckoning. And chapter 12, as Rosie read, sets the scene for the final showdown. And God gives devastating, sorry, detailed instructions to prepare for what was to come. Something so devastating and dramatic that it would need absolute obedience to ensure his people's safety. And something so dramatic that it would be co um, commemorated for generations to come. This final plague was the ultimate disaster, the final plague of the firstborn. For as Deuteronomy 21 explains, the firstborn son is the first sign of the father's strength. Even more than today, in those times and cultures, the father's hopes and dreams were bound up in his firstborn son. They were decreed blessed 
and received a double share of their inheritance. This was hugely significant. In chapter 11, God had instructed the Israelites to ask their Egyptian neighbors for silver and gold. <laughs> Quite the slightly bizarre instruction, but it was met with surprising favor and gave them the resources that they would need for the future and some recompense for centuries of slavery. And now, on the 10th day of this new month, in the new year, they were to choose a male lamb without blemish, perfect, because what is set aside for God's purposes deserves to be the best. Each family was to be realistic about what they could eat and share between households if necessary, so no more were to be slaughtered than they needed. Then they were to slaughter the lamb at twilight on the 14th day and daub its blood on the door lintels and doorposts. Then they were to roast the lamb with bitter herbs. God had prescribed a dress code too, not their finery for a feast or PJs for a cozy night in, but they were dressed for action, for a quick departure and a long journey. And this was to be no communal barbecue. They were each to feast inside their homes, for during the night, God himself would visit the final judgment. And true enough, at midnight, when all the surplus lamb had been burned, Across Egypt, the firstborn of each and every household was found dead. From Pharaoh to the lowliest of slaves, every single household, except where the Israelites lived with their blood daubed doorways. Amid national wailing and cries of grief, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron. Go! Leave my people, you Israelites. Go! Worship the Lord. Take your flocks and go. So they went. They took their unleavened bread, as God has instructed. They took their silver and their gold. 630,000 men, plus women and children, and others who'd chosen to follow them. Around 3 million people following Moses to freedom after 430 years in Egypt. That's like us being in slavery since 1591, when Queen Elizabeth was on the throne. In the nine previous plagues, God had needed to stretch, uh, Moses had needed to stretch out his hand to bring on the plague. But this 10th plague was different. It needed no intermediary as God himself stepped in to redeem them with an outstretched arm and mighty acts of judgment. It is a dramatic account of God's power and God's protection. But why? Well, God needed both the Egyptians and his chosen people to understand who he was. A God who rightly inspires awe and trust and faith in those who choose to follow his word. A God who is worthy of worship. He was shaping a nation of holy people to honour him and reflect his character. They were his precious, beloved, chosen people. As he told Moses in Exodus chapter 4, Israel is my firstborn son the first fruits of my people. And as much as God is love, 
love also demands holy justice. When those who oppress God's people stand to account. And there will always be a day of reckoning when his righteous justice and judgment will be reconciled. So this Passover had two elements, freedom and redemption. Because freedom without relationship was not enough. And like everything God does with us and for us, he gave us, he gave his people a choice to put their trust in him and become his redeemed people and grow in a loving relationship with him. The first step for those Israelites was to take a step of faith from the darkness of slavery to the light of freedom to discover that they needed faith to accept and act on God's word, to follow each instruction to the letter, to paint the blood on their doorways. It needed trust to sit in their homes while death stalked the land and passed over their households. But why the blood? We may balk at the idea of painting blood on doorposts, but blood was the way those people understood sacrifice. The substitution of one life laid down to save another. But of course, God didn't need the blood as a sign to know which house to avoid. It it wasn't as if he needed maps or directions. He already knew their households. He knew which were the Israelite crops and cattle as the previous plagues had indicated. But when he saw the blood on the houses, he passed over in peace because the Israelites were saved by their acts of faith and obedience. The day of judgment had arrived for all of Egypt. Yet God had found a way to substitute one death for another, releasing his people from the curse of the plague. Because the Passover lamb, the sacrificial lamb, had two purposes. It was both sustenance for the journey and secured the right to be saved from death. This Ancient act of mercy was the first fruits of God's eternal covenant plan for his beloved people. But God knows too that we are fickle creatures with short memories. We need to remember God between the miracles. So he instituted an annual feast of Passover to remind Israel that her life as his people was grounded in his divine act, redemptive act in Exodus. And we read in the Old Testament how those Israelites both honored and dishonored God, how they both remembered but often forgot him between the miracles. It's a long story that shows the infinite mercy and patience of God. Until the day when he chose to step in with his final act of redemption. And with no intermediary, he stretched out both of his arms. Centuries later, the birth of the Savior delivered delivered all those prophecies and promises that had been spoken. Jesus, born of Mary, was the firstborn son of God. To quote Deuteronomy again, the firstborn of our heavenly father as the sign of the father's strength. 30 years later, having been filled with the Holy Spirit after battling in the wilderness for 40 days, Jesus was ready for his mission. He presented himself for baptism at the River Jordan, where his cousin John recognized him and exclaimed, 
Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The promised Messiah had arrived, although not everyone was as perceptive or welcoming as John. I wonder whether we think of Jesus as the first Christian, but actually he was thoroughly Jewish. He celebrated all those festivals instituted by God. They were intrinsic to his own life and pattern of faith. Three years later, when Jesus came for the last time to Jerusalem, he gave his disciples instructions to prepare for the Passover. Little did they know that he was about to complete the work begun at the first Passover festival, when he would become the eternal Passover lamb. By that time in Jewish history, the festival itself had three distinct elements. The Passover celebration itself, the festival of unleavened bread to remember the haste at which their ancestors left Egypt, and then the festival of first fruits. To prepare for those festivals, the Jews took their lamb at the beginning of the week. They took it to the temple for the priest to inspect that it was without blemish. They would sweep their homes, checking for no speck of leaven in the house, no yeast that was symbolic of the malice and evil. They would gather the bitter herbs to remember those bitter years of slavery and that great and terrible act in Egypt centuries before. And on what we call Palm Sunday, Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey and was proclaimed king by the people. And the next day with those hosannas still echoing, Jesus, the Lamb of God, presented himself to the priests in the temple. He'd gone to cleanse God's house from the leaven of evil and malice that he'd identified in the Pharisees and Jewish hierarchy. And then after he'd driven out the moneylenders, he taught the people with stories and parables, including the parable of the tenants, where the landowner, you may remember, sent his servants to collect the harvest, but one by one, the tenants killed each servant until, as in Matthew 21, Jesus said, last of all, he, the landowner, sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir, come on, let's kill him. By this, Jesus had revealed his identity for those with ears to hear. But those in authority were too corrupt to understand and plotted his death. Four days later, with the Passover lamb roasting on Maundy Thursday, Jesus sat with his disciples in the upper room, sharing the Passover meal. He broke the unleavened bread and gave it to them saying, take and eat, this is my body. He took the cup of wine and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. by which Jesus was instituting a new memorial, another meal for us to remember God between the miracles, that which we call Holy Communion. And on that Friday, Jesus was crucified. His blood was shed and daubed on the cross. He had become the one perfect sacrificial lamb of God who freely gave himself for us. Jesus was buried over the feast of Matzah, 
the festival of unleavened bread, where Jews were remembering their release to freedom. Three days later, on the day of the first Sabbath after Passover, known as the festival of first fruits, the day we call Easter Sunday, the empty tomb heralded the first fruits of God's eternal new covenant. Jesus, our risen savior and victorious king, the Holy One had brought freedom and redemption for all people, for all time. With his double inheritance of redeeming both the Israelites and the Gentiles. By becoming the Passover lamb himself, God had ushered in a new order so that all who place their trust in the blood of Jesus might find forgiveness from malice and evil, from all sin and unholiness, plus the freedom and life in all its fullness, plus eternal redemption in a loving relationship with God. It was never in Jesus' mind or in the disciples' mind when they taught those first believers that the roots of our Christian faith should be pruned away from the Hebraic roots. As Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 5, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. No, I have come to fulfill them. Those first believers knew inherently why all this had such significance, but perhaps we've lost some of that in translation, forgotten how to read the New Testament in the context of the old. So with our long view, we've journeyed from 1300 BC to around AD 33, and now we come to today. Understanding that long view and context help us see why what Jesus did really, really matters and why it's so utterly life changing for us. So what's our response to that? Well, freedom from fear of judgment for a start. Because when we put our faith in Jesus, we do not need to fear the day of judgment. Because the blood of the Lamb of God has paid the price for everything that once separated us from God. Because on that cross, seeing the blood of Jesus, God's judgment passes over us in peace. Because of him, we have the freedom to escape the slavery of sin and death, not by our own acts, but by God's actions. So that his love and his plans will be fulfilled in each home, in each heart where people put their faith in him. And in the meantime, as we rest in his love, we can still examine our hearts for signs of leaven. And as we celebrate and remember what Jesus has done for us, like those first freed slaves, let us choose to believe and trust and follow God's word as his beloved people. Amen. I think we're going to our intercessions now. We sang the creedal song this morning, affirming who we put our faith into. So now um, I'm going to ask Mark who's going to come and bring us the intercessions. Thank you, Mark. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can approach you because Jesus gave himself as a sacrifice to pay the price for our rebellion, to save us from an eternity separated from you, to give us a resurrection life after our physical death. Heavenly Father, we accept that without the sacrifice of blood, there is no forgiveness of our sins. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that for the joy of saving us, you would allow us, the human race, to nail you down upon that cross. Thank you for purging the bloody stains of our unfaithfulness and washing us clean. Lord Jesus, you command us, your redeemed people, to put you first and to think like you, to do what you do, to sacrifice like you, to love like you, and to share your blood-bought love with each other and those we live next to, to show mercy when we're wronged, to forgive, to deliver justice and fight for the oppressed. Father, we have come together to ask that by the presence and work of the Holy Spirit, you will lead us to live like you, Jesus, free from selfishness and this world's temptations. We owe you our lives. Lord, why have you limited the exercise of your love by asking us to be your hands? You know how weak and selfish we are. Heavenly Father, give us the courage to meet the physical, mental, emotional and financial needs of those who are struggling around us. To show them Jesus. To feed their families and pay basic bills in Bassett Lawrence throughout the country for those recovering from all kinds of addiction in our families, in our prisons and on our streets. To turn from exploitation like Zacchaeus the tax thief, to find refuge from violence, asylum seekers in this country and around the world, to survive injustice and government oppression in Myanmar, Venezuela, Syria and around the world. Lord, you said to the prophet Jeremiah, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? Lord, help us to live as Jesus lives. Father, we continue to, uh, to enable, we continue to ask you to enable the fight against COVID, that nations will work together for the common good. For those left bereaved and damaged, Father, in your mercy, show them Jesus by your, the work of your Holy Spirit in their lives. And Father, we lift to you our fellowship here in Ratford. We remember those who are bereaved, those suffering from the effects of age and infirmity, those awaiting treatments of all kinds, Kenny Newstead recovering in hospital, those supporting family members with long-term illnesses, syndromes and conditions. We remember all these people and more before you now, Lord, and ask for your intervention by our hands and by the work of your spirit. Father, we thank you for your enduring presence as we remember all that you have done through Christ our Saviour. In his name we pray. Amen. As God's people, we pray together now the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I think we're going to have our final song now, which is the most appropriate song. So thank you, Julie, for choosing this one. It's Guide Me, O Thou Great Redeemer. And if anything reminds us of that exodus of three million people out from slavery to freedom as they went across a promised land or towards a promised land. And as we continue that epic pilgrimage today, let's join together and sing in our hearts or sing out loud this amazing song of worship. Thank you. Pray together. In darkness and in light, in trouble and in joy, help us, Heavenly Father, to trust your love, to serve your purpose, and to praise your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So, using the prayer that God gave to Aaron and Moses, the prayer of blessing in Numbers, may the Lord bless you and watch over you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look kindly on you and give you his peace and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and those whom you love this day and evermore. Amen. I'm just going to adapt the last sentence. So go and grow in kindness and go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.